proposed revisions that always seem to involve less respect for the rights of free nations and less freedom for the individual. These matters would be difficult under any circumstances. They are further complicated by a trend in Western countries away from global engagement and democratic confidence. Parts of Europe have developed an identity crisis. We have seen insolvency, economic stagnation, youth unemployment, anger about immigration, resurgent ethno-nationalism, and deep questions about the meaning and durability of the European Union. America is not immune from these trends. In recent decades, public confidence in our institutions has declined. Our governing class has often been paralyzed. The American dream of upward mobility seems out of reach for some who feel left behind in a changing economy. Bigotry seems emboldened. Politics seems more vulnerable to conspiracy theories and outright fabrication. You both were members of Spell and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322, a secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets. Now, as you may know, my running mate, Tim, is Catholic and went to Jesuit schools. And one of the things he and I have talked about is this idea from the Jesuits of the Magis, the more, the better. Hello, everybody. We got another reading of Code Word Barbalon today on this beautiful, sunny day there in Europe and in America here as well. I'm gathered here with Yerk Blissman on Skype. And it is 9 o'clock in the morning here, and I would imagine it is 4 o'clock in the afternoon in Belgium. And we are in uh, Cecil Rhodes' chapter, The Global Manipulator. And this is chapter 36, was it, Jörg? If I'm not mistaken, yeah, I think it is chapter 36. Yeah, it's a big one. You missed, <laughs> you missed on that yesterday. Yeah, it's 36. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, okay. That's what it is, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a it's a very interesting reading we did yesterday, Yerk. I was very, oh, very yeah. intrigued by it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. So uh, make sure that you take a good seat, and uh, when you're watching this video, make sure that you have a good seat in your chair, that you have a cup of coffee or whatever prepared to follow this one, because this noon already I had the chance to read a little bit in this book, and I read until the end of the chapter, and I can tell you this is very interesting what we are going to read about. Yeah, I'm sitting out here in the sun, and I really I have to put down the shades on the on the terrace here, so ah. that engine is going to work now, because, yeah, I'm in the full sun, and I was already this noon for an hour, and I'm quite a little bit burned, so I don't want to exaggerate that. Sun sure. is good. Sun is good, but uh, don't overdo it. Huh? Don't overdo it. Uh, That's right. And we have a little bit of, uh, above 80 degrees today, so it's really a summer day, even yep. though it is just spring. But, you know, that's the weather that we have here. We have nice springs, but then we have almost no summer at all. So, Yeah, Jörg, I think, you know, I, I really like laying in the sun, too. And what I would do is lay for 15 minutes in direct sun, and then I would go and, and uh, you know, take precautions to... You know, just do little 15-minute increments, uh, I, I found was really good. Um, yeah, that's, that's no, that's no that problem. That way you don't, I don't get have, burned, you know. I don't have a problem with sitting half an hour or so in the sun here, but uh, my arms are a little bit burned. I feel that when I'm sitting in the sun here. Yeah. Now I'm, yeah. now I'm under, un, under the screen from the, from the terrace here, so that's okay. Yeah, if you work in it all day, that's a different thing, yeah. And that's a different thing, yeah. Then you also take precautions. Yeah. But I don't normally take uh, sunblock mm. uh, products no. because uh, no. they are not good for you. Better to wear good only... clothing that reflects the UV, yeah. Yeah, because the sunblockers, they only take care of that your body cannot make any vitamin D. And that's why we have such an unhealthy society today. Yes, it is. Because we are all mm. lacking vitamin D from when the sun comes out uh, then we really should make sure that we expose our arms and hands and face at least 15 minutes a day to the sunlight so that we can make naturally vitamin D, which is very, very important. Mm -hmm. and 
I, I of course know that a little bit better than many other people because I have mm -hmm. multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. And um, since I take vitamin D, I feel much better. I never had a second attack. I mean, knock Good. on wood, but uh, up to now, I never had a second attack. So, All right. Well, I'm ready when you are, Jörg. Yeah, sure. I'm ready. <clears throat> and for everybody who reads along it, uh... the own copy of his book, no, I think we have to start in um, 368. Oh, 368. Okay. Milner's, Milner's Kindergarten. Cool. The Perfect Min. I don't think that we read that already. No, we didn't. Okay, good. So we're going to start there for everybody who reads along in his own copy of the book on page 368 of the book Code with Babylon, 603 score and 6, Danger in the Vatican. The Sons of Loyola and Their Plans for World Domination by P.D. Stewart. Continuing in Chapter 36, Cecil Rhodes, The Global Manipulator. In the under chapter called Behind Milner's Kindergarten, The Perfect Min. Everyone knows that it was as a result of the various wills of the Freemason Cecil Rhodes that the Rhodes Scholarships were established. But while the existence of the Rhodes Scholarship Program is not a secret, the reason for its establishment is. Moreover, the fact that it is based on the constitutions of the Jesuits is not widely known. Therefore, you need to read books like this. Not surprisingly, all Rhodes scholars must go to that other great Jesuit stronghold, Oxford University in England. This scholarship, perhaps, the most prestigious and coveted prize in all of academy, was for the establishment of a system of educating chosen men as part of a secret society which would carry out the above purposes as expressly stated in Rhodes' wills. The scholarship would enable a handful of select foreign nationals to study at that bastion of concealed Catholicism. Professor Quigley writes that, quote, For this purpose, Rhodes left part of his great fortune, estimated to be over three million pounds, at the time we are speaking of, beginning of the 20th century, at his death, to found the Rhodes Scholarships at Oxford, unquote. The Rhodes Scholarship was to be a feeder of institutions of power. Apart from, quote, unquote, gifting us with, a last, with, at, with at least one United States president, namely Je Bill, uh, William Jefferson, or short Bill Clinton, the Rhodes Scholarship has produced three U.S. Supreme Court justices, John Marshall Harlan, Byron White, and David Souter, and other influential world figures. It was Supreme Court Justice Harlan who said that the American Constitution did not survive the Civil War. A Rhodes Scholar, a man who has pledged his life for a quote-unquote new world order, for the supremacy of the Antichrist in this world, said the American Constitution did not survive the Civil War. That's why, in my opinion at least, George W. Bush was quoted as saying the Constitution is just a GD piece of paper. What, P.D. Stewart continues then, can be asserted with regard to the impact and historical significance of the Rhodes Scholarship? Indeed, what was its true character and influence? Does the Rhodes Scholar Network still carry out its founder's aims today? Just what is a Rhodes Scholarship anyway? Now the answer comes from page 33 in Carol Quigley's book, Tragedy and Hope. Quote, the scholarships were merely a facade to conceal the secret society, or, more accurately, they were to be one of the instruments by which the members of the secret society could carry out his purpose. Unquote. Now, Quigley's protege was President William Jefferson Bill Clinton, who is perhaps the world's most famous Rhodes Scholar. And what was Rhodes' purpose in setting up the scholarship? Nothing less, said Rhodes, than a scheme to take the government of the world. Nothing less than a scheme to take the government of the world in accordance with Revelation 13. Which other organization has this 
as its all consuming agenda. Now, that's a hard one to think on, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, the Jesuits of the Roman Catholic Church. The recipient of a Rhodes Scholarship, in essence, makes a deal with the Illuminati to help further its power in the United States. Or you could also say, the recipient of a Rhodes Scholarship, in essence, makes a deal with the devil to help the Antichrist rule the world. The Rhodes Scholarship Network, Milner's Kindergarten, is still very powerful even today. They had a great reunion in Oxford in 1893, 1983, excuse me. They had a great reunion in Oxford in 1983, attended by the Queen of England as published by the Times on July 11th, 1983. When that article was published, the Times had six Rhodes Scholars on its board. And now we come to a very interesting subject, sub-chapter, which is called Bill Clinton, an enigma. Or do you have any comments or questions up to here, Brad? No, please, go ahead. Now read what Professor Carol Quigley, whom Bill Clinton praises so much, says on page 21 of his book about those groomed under the Rhodes Scholarship Scheme. Quote, There is some question whether the ability of the fellows of old souls to elect as their younger colleagues uh, colleagues, men with brilliant futures, is to be explained by their ability to discern greatness at an early age, or by the fact that election to the fellowship opens the door to achievement in public affairs. There's some reason to believe that the second of these two alternatives is of greater weight, unquote. meaning that the fellows of all souls, which is a rude scholar's secret society, to elect their younger colleagues, men with brilliant futures, is to be explained by their ability to discern greatness at an early age, or by the fact, and that is the one of greater weight, the fact that election to the fellowship opens the door to achievement in public affairs. So it doesn't even matter who you are, or what you have learned, what Degrees you hold when you are chosen and put through the road scholarships, you are a person that it is elected for fellowship that will achieve um, to open doors in public affairs. And we will read in this coming subchapter how that was done to Bill Clinton. This is just incredible. When you when we are done with this. I think you will lean back and you will have a whole other view of Bill Clinton, the former United States president. Mm -hmm. Bill Clinton is a prime example of these last alternative, yeah? That one that is of greater weight, that the election of the fellowship opens the door to achievement in public affairs. Of this, Bill Clinton is a prime example. Although Bill Clinton was a real scholar, he never completed his, study, his studies at Oxford. He left without an Oxford degree. His Oxford coursework never added up to a degree. Why? <laughs> he did not need it. The Rhodes Scholar always rises to the top. After leaving Oxford without a degree, Clinton attended Yale Law School reputedly the best law school in the United States of America. According to historian David Morales, who wrote the biography of Clinton, Bill Clinton, quote-unquote, graduated from Yale without a law degree, for which he studied. Morales says, quote, Clinton was never first in his, acad uh, in his class academically. He was fifth in his high school class, unquote. Yet, Clinton was elected Phi Beta Kappa at the Jesuit-run Georgetown University. There are many sites on the internet incorrectly saying that Clinton has a law degree from Yale. Unbelievably, after leaving Yale without a degree, Clinton got a post as professor of law 
at the University of Arkansas. How does see, a person... See, Yerk, uh, I yeah. just had a, a little glitch here, and I yeah. lost that last couple sentences. Would you mind repeating those for me? <laughs> I'm, I'm yes. sorry. It's just that the backup recording that I'm doing isn't going to work out, and I'm just hoping that uh, that's not too much of a glitch for <laughs> our listeners here. Oh, sorry okay, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Uh, we still have we still have my recording, of course. There's right. no glitch in there, I think. But uh, I will I will uh, pick it up at after leaving Oxford. Is that okay? Yes, thank you. On sorry. the bottom of page three sixty nine, after leaving Oxford without a degree, Bill Clinton attended Yale Law School, reputedly the best law school in the United States of America. According to historian David Moranis, who wrote the biography of Clinton, Bill Clinton, quote-unquote, graduated from Yale without a law degree, for which he studied. Moranis says, quote, Clinton was never first in his class academically. He was fifth in his high school class, unquote. Yet, Clinton was elected Phi Beta Kappa at the Jesuit-run Georgetown University. There are many sites on the internet incorrectly, that should be underlined here, mm. incorrectly saying that Bill Clinton has a law degree from Yale. Unbelievably, after leaving Yale without a degree, Clinton got a post as professor of law at the University of Arkansas. How does a person who never finished his university education at two separate Ivy League universities get appointed as assistant professor of law at the University of Arkansas? How would you like it if your child's law professor were a law school dropout? Anyone else? And that would be regarded as rather mediocre. Clinton was also attorney general of Arkansas without a law degree. How is that possible? How is that possible? Well, we turn back one page and we read that election to the fellowship opens the door to achievement public affairs. When you are elected, it doesn't matter how you are in school. Degrees don't matter. You get any job you want. You don't need a degree because you have powerful people backing you up. As the biographer of Viscount Halifax puts it, quote, it is safe to assert that the fellow of all souls, which is Rhodes Scholars, is a man marked out for a position of authority in public life. And there is no surprise if he reaches the summit of power, but only disappointment if he falls short of the opportunities that are set out before him, unquote. The moral of all this. Not everyone who rises to greatness, presidents, prime ministers, etc., are necessarily men of the highest ability. Such men are often chosen for their usefulness to the powers that rule behind the scenes. Carol Quickly, Bill Clinton's Jesuit professor, informs us that, quote, in his Confession of Faith, Rhodes outlined the types of persons who might be useful members of this secret society, unquote. Now, President William Jefferson Bill Clinton was such a man. A Rhodes Scholar who got the usual ticket to Oxford and then jumped into the White House by intrigues. And according to Quigley, Bill, Men Bill Clinton's mentor, Rhodes Scholars are tools, meaning instruments, of the Rhodes Secret Society to achieve the society's goal. For only those who would carry forward the ideals and purpose of the Rhodes Milner Secret Society were to be granted Rhodes scholarships. If you're one of those hooked on the notion of Clinton is a nice guy, then consider these words of his, quote, we can't be so fixated on our desire to preserve the rights of ordinary Americans, unquote. This is taken from USA Today, March 11th of 1993, and again from the San Franciscan Chronicle, Sunday, April 21st, 2002. 
Now, let me ask my fellow American brethren, fellow brethren in the name of Jesus Christ, not as being an American, let me ask you, what do you think of an American president who openly states, written black on white for everybody to see and to study for them all, for themselves and to find out that he says, we can't be so fixated on our desire to preserve the rights of ordinary Americans. The American nation for the moment, the United States of America, counts about 320 million inhabitants. How many of these 320 million inhabitants, Brett, mm -hmm. would you say are quote-unquote ordinary Americans? <laughs> oh boy, I don't know. Not Let's say at least 310 million, right? Mm-hmm are more or less, quote-unquote, ordinary Americans. Mm -hmm. So that means that your president in the 1990s states that the government of the United States cannot be so fixated on the desire to preserve the rights of the majority of the inhabitants of the United States of America. Now, he says that in 1993, what happened eight years later? Mm -hmm. September 11th, 2001. And within three months after September 11th, 2001 happened, the Patriot Act was put out. And a result of the Patriot Act was, and still is today, that... Uh, that... Uh, let me find this here that the rights of northern ordinary Americans are not preserved anymore. That means that within eight years of Bill Clinton stating this, he took away the rights of most of quote-unquote ordinary Americans. Sure. Don't you agree, yeah. Brett? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, through the, through the system of government, that is, yeah. So... Um, Bill Clinton just acting as a stooge um, did it. Um, yeah. You know, he was just an instrument, another instrument of the devil, as far as I'm concerned. But, yeah, uh, of course he was an instrument because we read it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We read it right here in this book that they are tools, they are instruments. Yeah. Yeah. That's to right. achieve the goal of the society. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So when you say he was just a tool, yeah, absolutely. You are just saying what Pete we already wrote read. Wrote early in this book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we already read. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a shame, but it is true. It is. And I think there should be more people reading this book and checking out the sources and understand what your quote-unquote elected presidents think of you mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And how they deal with you people. And how they deal with the quote-unquote rights they give you people. Yep. That's right, Yerk. Yep. If more people actually would recognize the truth behind what's going on here, I think that they would be more likely not to vote. <laughs> <laughs> you can save your gas when you drive to yeah. the ballot. And right. uh, bet better go to a McDonald's and stuff yourself a little more. <laughs> oh, jeez, McDonald's. Yeah, I'm sorry, but, you know. Yeah, I agree. A, a toxic food is better than toxic uh, foreign policies and governments. And You can better poison your own body than poison the whole nation by going to the ballot yeah. and voting for the devil. Yeah, there you go. That's what I meant. Well, and you can always detoxify your body later. This is true. <laughs> you know. Yeah. When you really, when you really get down to it, you know, you, you gotta work on multiple fronts. It's not just your, your spiritual life. It's your physical life. You know, there's all kinds of problems. Yeah. So I'm going to continue. And for continuing, I still start, I, I start repeating, reading this last paragraph from the beginning on page 370. If you are one of those hooked on the notion of Clinton is as a nice guy, there were so many people who were saying, 
oh, George W. Bush was a nice guy, or his <laughs> yeah. father was a nice guy, or Ronald Reagan was such a nice guy. Yeah, that's right. When you are hooked to that notion that these people are nice guys, consider what Bill Clinton said in 1993. Quote, we can't be so fixated on our desire to preserve the rights of ordinary Americans, unquote. And it bears repeating that the Rhodes Secret Society was founded on the constitutions of the Jesuits. And so we have to consider whether Clinton, a former student of Jesuit Georgetown University, being selected for a Rhodes Scholarship, might not also be a tool of the Jesuits. Is it a coincidence that Mr. Rhodes would set up a secret society, giving instructions in his wills to conceal his plans for that society by replacing the words Roman Catholic religion in the Jesuit constitutions with the word English empire? Once again, we see the frightful intrigues of the Jesuit order. To quote William T. Stead, who was Rhodes' collaborator and mentor. Mr. Rhodes was more than the founder of a dynasty. He aspired to be the creator of one of those vast semi-religious, quasi-political associations, which, like the Society of Jesus, have played so large a part in the history of the world. To be more strictly accurate, he wished to found an order as the instrument of the will of the dynasty, and while he lived, he dreamed of being both its Caesar and its Loyola." Unquote. And it was Oxford University that Rhodes and his helpers would use as the training ground for their New World Anglo-American operatives. Now Carroll quickly tells us further on page 33 of his book, that Lord Milner and, C and uh, Cecil, Cecil Rhodes, quote, were contemporaries at Oxford, but more than that, they were members of a secret society which had been founded in 1891. The secret society of Cecil Rhodes is mentioned in the first five of his seven wills. In the fifth will, it was supplemented by the idea of an educational institution with scholarships whose alumni would be bound together by common ideals. Rhodes ideals. This is a secret oath. However, that there has been an attempt to cover up this Jesuit conspiracy is seen from the fact that in 1912, Sir George Parkin, a Canadian graduate of Oxford and former principal of Upper Canada College, wrote a book called The Rhodes Scholarships, in which he devoted several pages to each of Rhodes' seven wills. Yet, listen closely, he said nothing, not one word, about the secret society expressly mentioned in all but two of Mr. Rhodes' wills. Now, what is most astonishing about Parkin's failure to mention the secret society, which finds, it, which finds so central a place in five of Mr. Rhodes' seven wills, is that Parkin was the organizing secretary of the Rhodes Scholarship from 19, 1902 until his retirement in 1918. We are left to assume that Parkin's failure to even mention the secret society was deliberate. Especially since Parkin matriculated from Oxford on the same day as Cecil Rhodes and was charged with much of the organization and implementation of the scholarships throughout North America. How could Dr. Parkin not have known of this key fact? How could he have overlooked the use of the Jesuit constitutions? <laughs> he could not have overlooked, dear listener, dear viewer of this video, dear reader of this book. It was deliberately omitted. Mm -hmm. Coming back to the most famous Rhodes scholar, Bill Clinton. 
Clinton still speaks highly of his Jesuit professors at Georgetown University. Clinton expressed his admiration for the Jesuit Carroll Quigley in 1898 in Antaeus, journals, notebooks and diaries. Clinton even gave his former mentor Quigley tribute in his presidential nomination speech at the Democratic Party convention in 1992. And on November 7, 2001, Bill Clinton gave a speech at Georgetown University on foreign policy and globalization. Joseph Kerr, the Washington Times, November 8, 2001, reports that Clinton, a member of the class of 1968, opened his 50-minute speech by thanking another of his former professors, the Jesuit Otto Hentz. Quote, I would also like to say a special word of thanks to one of my professors, Father Otto Hentz, unquote, Clinton said. Further, he quotes, he never abandoned me over all these years, when though he did not succeed in convincing me to become a Jesuit, unquote. He then added, however, that Otto Hentz never abandoned him over all these years. Over all what years? <laughs> During his years in public life and while he occupied the White House, he still was controlled by Father Otto Hens from the Society of Jesus. Yeah, right here it says in the footnote, uh, Hens is an associate professor in the theology department at Georgetown University. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Huh? And that Clinton took theological classes in Catholic doctrines while a student at Georgetown is confirmed by Stephen J. Rosenberg. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very interesting I, paragraph. I told here. <laughs> you, I told you during the reading of this chapter. <laughs> Of oh, this part, this under part of the chapter, the Enigma of Clinton, what we are reading right now in uh, Cecil Rhodes' chapter 36 of Cold World Babylon, that makes your tail nose curl. Yeah, he never abandoned me over your, all these Your foot years. nails, sorry, your foot yeah. nails curl. That's what I wanted to say. That <laughs> yeah, makes right. your foot nails curl. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's so funny, though, this quote from Clinton. He never abandoned me over all these years, even though he did not succeed in convincing me to be a Jesuit. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you believe that one? <laughs> uh, when you believe that one, I also have a bridge to sell you on the moon. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we're saying. Man. As a child, P.D. Stewart continues... Clinton went to St. John's Catholic School, and he also attended the Jesuit Georgetown University, so he had a very good Catholic education. Now, I do not say here that Clinton is or was at any time a Jesuit, for I cannot prove it. But if anyone were to come forward with proof, I should not be the least surprised. Clearly, the Jesuit professor Quigley and Hens saw Clinton as an asset to their cause. And it would seem that he has served them just as well as, political, as a political protégé, if not as a Jesuit. Well, you don't have to be, and that is something that we learned already in this book and by my comments when I told you about the book of Griesinger, Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a full professed Jesuit to be a Jesuit. It is most um, understandably enough when you are becoming a Jesuit coadjutor. So I don't think that there are many things that speak against the fact that Bill Clinton probably was a Jesuit coadjutor. Mm -hmm. And even if he was not a trained coadjutor, and even if he was not a trained Jesuit, he was a Jesuit in his heart. I think that is something that we can establish here without any hesitation. Mm -hmm. Don't you think, Brett? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely right. Sure helps to read these paragraphs, though. Mm -hmm. Now, during his acceptance speech, 
in 1992, Bill Clinton alluded to this fact by deliberately misquoting 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Quote, and this is what Clinton says. This is not the Bible quote. The Bible quote Bill um, Brett will read after I read the quote of this book, what Bill Clinton read as his acceptance at his acceptance speech. From 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, Bill Clinton reads, quote, As the scripture says, Our eyes have not yet seen, nor our ears heard, nor our minds imagined what we can build. The actual passage in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, does not use the word build. What does the actual passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 say, Brett? Okay, it is, I will quote from my 1611 King James Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So this is not even a quote from the Bible, even though that he says, as Scripture says. So Bill Clinton makes up his own Bible as he goes along, as any good Jesuit, of course, would do. Right? Mm -hmm. Clinton continued by naming the Jesuit who directed him and to whom he owed his high station. As student at Georgetown, I heard that call to build clarified by a professor named Carol Quigley. Unquote. Now, what is that call? And what are they building? Well, what are they building, Brad? <coughs> oh, they're building a uh, Nova Sordo Seclorum. <laughs> or a modern Tower of Babel. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's more accurate. The yeah. following revelation exposes the defiling alchemy of the Jesuits and their secret plan for building a new world order within the Rhodes Secret Society and the Rhodes Scholarship Scheme. Quoting sections from the American Review of Reviews, May 1902, page 556, Stead, who was Cecil Rhodes' closest collaborator, quotes directly from Mr. Rhodes in a letter written in 1890, quote, Please remember the key of my idea discussed with you is a society copied from the Jesuit as to organization, unquote. Now, read what Bill Clinton, the famous Rhodes scholar, said about two leading Jesuits from Georgetown, where he was trained and grooming or groomed for the U.S. presidency. Quote, I have to say a special word by leave of Father O'Donnell about two past presidents of Georgetown, both named Healy. The second, Timothy Healy, passed away just a few days ago, and he was Father O'Donovan's predecessor. He was my friend. And in his effects, when he died, were found four pages of an outline of instructions for me for my inaugural address when I become United States President. And I know he is looking down at us, and I want him to know that I have absorbed the instructions, and I have taken some and rejected some. Unquote. Note here, he did not say what part he had rejected or what part he had accepted. So, there you have it. Plain and clear. In your face. What more proof do you want? President Bill Clinton was jobbed into office by his Jesuit handlers, whose intellectual heavyweights are headquartered at Georgetown University. As someone once said, these Jesuits are ambitious. They are flatterers of princes and deceitful courtiers everywhere entangling themselves in secular business and in politics. They are the Pied Pipers of Rome, 
no man who remains among them is or is mentored by them can retain his integrity or honesty. So says some of the most reliable authors, not least the ex-Jesuit Marcet de la Roche Arnaud, who spent eight years in a Jesuit seminary. If you are wondering why you haven't heard about this conspiracy before, well, it is because the Jesuits control every facet of the information industry, television, newspaper, and even public education, radio, Hollywood movies, the internet, and the so-called alternative media are points that P.D. Stewart does not count into this, but that I will add, because that is what the papal encyclical Miranda Prosos and Intermirifica tell us. Since the Roman Catholic Church considers it her birthright to own all these media, and the Roman Catholic Church has as its shock troops the Jesuit order, this is what P.D. Stewart actually means. They control every facet of the information industry. Yeah? And he makes another point that we should not just read over. He said, no man who remains among the Jesuits or is mentored by the Jesuits can retain his integrity or honesty. This should really sink in. We should really try to understand this. Because it means that you give up yourself. You become a puppet on a string. You become the axe in the hand of the woodcutter. You become the stick in the hand of an old man to be used as he wants to. You have to completely deny yourself and give up your integrity and honesty. Yeah. Now, where have you heard right. the expression, where have you heard the expression give up yourself before? In the Bible. Yep. Because Jesus asks that of everyone to who fo who wants to follow him to deny yourself and to pick up your cross and to follow Jesus. But in my humble, humble opinion, Brad, there's a big difference whether you deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow Jesus or you deny yourself and you pick up the cross and you follow the Antichrist through the Jesuit order. That's right. That's right. It's a very subtle difference in the regard of uh, its facade, its looks, its vanity. And that's what we have. We have this gigantic mother church of vanity. And, uh, you know, the world just tends to pay more attention to it because it doesn't require any, uh, shall we say, uh, righteousness. It just requires obedience. That's all. You just and have you to also, obey. Yeah, absolutely. And you also see that on the outside that a lot of these dogmas, even of the Jesuits, seem right. They do. Seem correct. They do. Absolutely. But only when you go to the ground of them, when you really dig deep enough, when you gain full understanding of the secret societies, you see how they twist and turn things that are positively written in Scripture, and they turn them 180 degrees completely around. And this is just one of that exam of those examples. Mm -hmm. Now I want to end with a little comment that I want to make on Bill Clinton, on, on on whom we have read quite an extensive part in this book. And it says, or P.D. Stewart said on the on the bottom of page three seventy one or so, uh, uh, or somewhere else that he said that. Um, uh, on page 372, P.D. Stewart says, I do not say you that Clinton is or was at any time a Jesuit, for I cannot prove it. Now, of course, I, I cannot prove it either. But I will tell you one thing in my closing comment of this broadcast. By their fruits, you will know them. 
And what are Bill Clinton's fruits? He became president in 1992, and he initiated a auto de fe, a inquisition on the people of Waco one year later in 1993. And if you want to get a good understanding of what really happened at Waco, go to YouTube and check out the videos of Bob Treffs, who made, I think, five or six hours, and sometimes videos even with, with, with before unseen footage, on the raid the American government through TFA and BTA, and I don't know how all these agents are called, and lit Literally, 60 plus persons, men, women, and children to fire. And when you know that that grew on the ground on orders of Bill Clinton, and when you know now how that he was Jesuit trained, how can you even doubt that he was? a Jesuit, when that was his fireproof, I call it, within the very first years of his presidency. Think about that. And for that, I want to leave the closing comment to my brother, Brett. Thank you, Yerk. Yeah, it really helps to get your perspective on that. And, uh, you know, living in America, I can vouch that uh, that whole episode in Waco is just just incredibly, um, I can't think of a, a good, clean word to use to describe it. So I'm not going to even say it because it's disgusting and it just is revolting. But that's what's happened to America. We've been taken over from within and from when it, within the most prized and precious institutions and uh, it's just plain sad. But uh, we can come out of it, and the Bible says to come out of her, and I do believe that's what the Bible is trying to tell us, is to come out away from the whore, come away from the harlots that are dealing this false gospel, and learn the true gospel, and you don't need anyone. It's sola scriptura the Bible and the Bible alone for God's glory alone. And, you know, it really becomes a lot more obvious once you start studying books like Code Word Barbell. And I want to thank your Glissman and thank you for watching and commenting and we'll catch up with you next time. God bless and bye-bye. For the first time in human history, for the first time in all of human history, almost all of mankind is politically awake. And these new and old major powers face still yet another novel reality, in some respects unprecedented. And it is that while the lethality, the lethality of their power is greater than ever, their capacity to impose control over the politically awakened masses of the world is at a historical low. I once put it rather pungently, and I was flattered that the British Foreign Secretary repeated this as follows. Namely, in earlier times, it was easier to control a million people, literally, it was easier to control a million people than physically to kill a million people. Today, it is infinitely easier to kill a million people than to control a million people. It is easier to kill than to control. We're, we're, we're at the very beginning stages of a very brutal and bloody conflict. Um, and I believe that um, we've come horribly off track uh, in the years uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union. And we're starting uh, now in the 21st century 
which I believe strongly is a crisis both of our church, a crisis of our faith, a crisis of the West, and a crisis of capitalism. His son Jesus is here in our midst. His bride, the church, is honored to host an event affirming the dignity of the human person and the sacredness of all human life. I think Russia is no longer a communist state, first of all. That's very important to realize. It hasn't yet defined itself, however, effectively as a democracy. It is still uncertain. We're, we're at the very beginning stages of a very brutal and bloody conflict of which if the people in this room and the people in the church do not bind together and really form what I feel is an aspect of the church militant, if the people in this room and the people in the church do not bind together and really form what I feel is an aspect of the church militant, the church militant, to really be able to not just stand with our beliefs, but to fight for our beliefs against this new barbarity that's starting, uh, that we will literally eradicate everything that we've been bequeathed over the last uh, 2,500 years. You didn't mention the president by name, but it was hard not to conclude that that's who you were referring to. Is that fair? I was certainly referring to the threats that we are now facing you know, with this stated goals of this administration, which would upset the last 70 years of a new world order, which was established after World War II. 70 years based on human rights, respect for the law, uh, free trade, all of the things and aspects of this world order that took place after one of the most horrific, uh, terrible wars in history, and I'm for maintaining it. We are grateful to be citizens of one nation under God, who acclaim this evening that in God we trust. Bless our two candidates, our benefactors, and those whom the L. Smith Foundation has been honored to serve for seven decades. Guide us safely home, both this evening and for all eternity, through Christ our Lord. Amen.